Now, <clears throat> let me actually introduce uh, Greg Pasternak. So, wow, oh, it's been now six years since I know him. Um, I think we ended up coming from kind of looking at the same issue, but from different perspectives. At least in my case, I, I started more from looking at environmental flows from the reservoir, from the infrastructure, how to put the water there. He is looking all the way, all the way around, which is basically within the channel. How does it look like? How the flow looks like? Within the flow and the and the and the geomorphology and the river channel, what are the relationships with with the ecosystem and then restoration, conservation? So it was kind of the same issue, just different perspective. Um, very good colleague and and, and a person that I have. It's a very great, great time. Just mention me. Great. Thank okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I appreciate Sarah and Sam inviting me to give the presentation for you guys today. And um, what I want to cover is some of the broad physical processes that occur on the landscape. So we'll work from the scale of a whole catchment or watershed down to what's happening in the channel and see what's influencing environmental flows. And together with the presentation that Sarah and Sam gave with you last week and that Eric Stein will give you in two weeks, you get a pretty good breadth of those physical processes. And some of the slides I'm going to show today will have more detail than I'm going to cover, but I want to give you that extra so that if you want to then go and think about that more, you can. But I want to stay at a pretty high level to give you a broad overview and really look at the interdisciplinary perspective on the whole thing. So what I want to cover uh, first is just looking at the broad overview, where does water and sediment come from that ends up in the river that we then worry about having enough flow in the river for the natural functioning. Uh, we're going to look at what is hydraulics and what are the methods that are used to characterize and predict it. How do we look at everything that's happening in a river to define what we call the spatial structure of that physical system and how that re relates to the patterns of biological data that might be in the river. And then I'm going to show you an example. Since so much of the class is on like natural flow assessment, I want to show you an alternative, which is like design. Because it's one thing to assess a river. It's another thing to design something. And environmental flows is one kind of design, changing the flow regime. But restoration is the other opportunity of like changing the topography and plantings in a river. Well, at the biggest scale, the landscape that we have is, see, oh yeah, it's raining, um, is a combination of climatic processes, particularly the precipitation, um, together with tectonic processes, you know, like the earth's rising and falling. And when those things come together, we get the formation of topography on the earth. And the sculpting of that topography goes by different hill slope processes like gullying, sheet wash, landsliding, uh, and bank erosion taking place in the channel. So these are some of the basic mechanisms by which sediment is being moved. And together, uh, these processes produce the sediment and flows that are moving down the river that create the physical template within which different ecological functions are going to happen. And the only thing missing here really is the chemistry, which is a whole nother aspect that is important too. All of those work together to produce a diversity of river landforms, going from more mountain river processes down to lowland rivers. Just this incredible diversity. I mean, some river classifications have like 100 different river types. So there's quite a lot of diversity there. And that diversity is also going to be reflecting the local geology and vegetation and other things that are going on, as well as those watershed inputs. So if you look at any one of these particular settings and you say, well, what should be the environmental flows? Uh, you have to be mindful of the watershed context that's producing the water and sediment that's going to then influence it. So let's look at the watershed as a whole and deconstruct the watershed into the basic elements that we need to be able to analyze. So at the watershed scale, if we take the land and we turn it into little volumetric cubes, these are called voxels. 
uh, you may be familiar with the word pixel, but when it's three-dimensional, it's called a voxel. And here's a representation of like the Olympic Peninsula National Forest in voxels. And we can compute something called the topographic wetness index, which just right off the bat gives you a sense of the relative wetness, where here blue is really wet and yellow to orange is really dry. And as you might expect, you know, uh, the tops of things, tops here indicated by these closed circles or these contour lines, <clears throat> so the tops of hills are relatively dry. And then where the land would be funneling water into convergent areas, it would be relatively wet. So just from the topography alone, you can get a sense of the relative wetness. And then that relative wetness is the first indicator of what the vegetation would be there. What um, migratory pathways might different organisms be taking through wetter or drier areas? What would the grain size of the soil development conditions be? So those are all really important <coughs> outcomes of knowing the wetness. The next level of understanding would be to take each individual voxel and do a water balance on that. So hydrology, more than anything else, is just basic accounting. My mother's an accountant. She accounts for people's money. I never thought I would be an accountant. I was like, you know, son, you want to come into my business? No, I don't, I don't want to do that. Well, now I'm an accountant. I do a lot of accounting. But, you know, as when you're talking about environmental flows, we're primarily talking about what ends up in a stream. We're not going to have that for the overland flow, but, but these are the two things of the actual surface expression of water. So we have to account for the evapotranspiration and precipitation, these sort of surface dynamics. And then the worst thing in the world, the water goes into this hole in the ground, and who knows what the heck is going down there. And so we have groundwater hydrologists who help us to understand all of those dynamics. Uh, and so that can be really complicated, but nevertheless, when you synergize all that together, you get the runoff that we see on the landscape. It gets even more complicated because we ultimately want to understand something about the environmental functions, and that has a lot to do with vegetation. But the vegetation is interacting also with the energy balance, because for a tree to grow, it has to have an excess of energy coming from the sun. So then you have to worry about you know, the overall energy coming from the sun, together with, uh, the, then there's losses that are going on, and you also have the fact that you could have snow and um, determination of you know, whether precipitation is snow or rain and how that gets intercepted by trees and lost. So there's a lot of canopy processes that come into play in that thinking. And then ultimately, you have to grow the trees, and that, that tree growth process <clears throat> can be modeled where like uh, on the right side here, <coughs> here, actually I'm gonna get a little bit better point here. Uh, okay, I slipped in the way. Anyway, uh, you can take the basic water balance, but then the excess energy that you have is gonna go into partitioning to grow carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and grow the tree. So, um, you know, so typically, um, somebody who's a, a biogeochemist and a plant physiologist can put together a model like this peanut model and so that you can grow forests based on the water and energy balance that you get out of it. So those are all things that are happening on the landscape. Then what has to happen is the water that is excess has to then run off the land and find its way to a stream. And so to get to that, you may start with a, a grid of elevations for your land surface, just a simple square grid. And you look at where the water flows from higher to lower cells, and you can create these flow direction sets. And then from those, you can connect them all up and get a flow network. And the good thing for, for us is that in the United States, that we have this national hydrography data set that has already been produced for us. It's got all of the streams and canals and ponds and lakes and all that in there. And it also has these watershed boundaries shown in yellow. So we've got all these subcatchments, and this is done at multiple resolutions. So a lot of that work has already been done, and you can just take advantage of it. So again, we're working from the top of the hills down, and now we've reached a point where you accumulate enough water, and we can ask the most famous question of all, where do channels begin? And so if you really want to learn this, we, we will derive the equations of this in my class next quarter. But it essentially begins somewhere on the landscape where you have enough raindrops that are accumulating 
so that not only is water ponding onto the surface, so it's not being sucked into the ground of, it's a sponge, but you have so much water that it has enough force to literally tear the ground open and dig a channel. And in an extreme case with like gullying, you know, here I am in my youth, standing in a, in a, a very deep gully head, but you know, here is just very subtle location where this channel begins. Even the channel, it's, it's dry most of the time, but there's enough times that there is a geometric expression, which I've highlighted there for help to help you see. So there, there will be a channel head location fed by a source area that's generally easy to saturate, and then um, that will be there. The channel head can also be influenced by landsliding, of course, um, can be a big factor. Why does that matter? Well, of course, you don't need any environmental flows above that point, so the environmental flows will start here. And then the alluvial sediment supply, that is the sediment being carried by a, a creek or whatever, is going to be coming from these channel head areas and working their way downstream. Um, it's possible to look at a derivation that shows for any given local slope, wherever you're standing on Earth, and the area that's contributing water to that location, what are the processes that are generating sediment at that location? And the, the options are landsliding, uh, which is the most violent, soil creep, which is just this very subtle, you know, earth movement, sheet wash, which is where you know, water is running off the surface, but it doesn't have enough force to dig a channel. It might just pick up little bits of sediment on the surface. And then channelization, as we already described. So there are very abrupt thresholds that dictate a tr transition from one to another sediment supply regime. And we can even make a map. So this is a, a Battle Creek catchment to the north here by Red Bluff and Lassen. And uh, all this orange shows that the majority of this area is dominated by sheet, sheet wash erosion during your typical January wet season in California. But there are other areas that are heavily landslide dominated, shown in purple and red. And, and the channelization areas, they're there. They're just, they're so tiny compared to the size of the watershed, but they're just all, the, the whole creek network would have those locations in there. But you can see in this case, like there's very little soil creep going on and there's a lot of sheet wash generating material. So those are just the very broad overview of like the generation of water and sediment. And when you want to create an environmental flow, you just have to be mindful that you have those source materials to work with. If you create too much flow, you're likely to instill erosion. If you don't create enough, you'll probably get deposition of the material that's coming in. So now you come into the channel and we have what we call hydraulics. Hydraulics we can define as dealing with what are the depths and velocities that are going on in the channel, like the shear stresses, the forces that are at work, that relates to this hydraulics. Uh, and we, hydraulics, you know, by virtue of having the hydro in there means that it's water flow, not air or something else. And then kinematics is the motion of all the things in that system. And usually when we're talking about rivers, the key variables you'll see are water surface elevation, which some people will, will add an L, like E-L, so W-S-E-L, but um, the water depth, which is just the water surface elevation minus the bed elevation, velocity usually given by V or U. Sometimes people are interested in the velocity gradient, which is the acceleration of the flow. And then shear stress, which is an expression of the friction between the water and the underlying ground surface. Um, you know, mathematically, most of the ecological functions that we have the ability to address in rivers today come from combinations of calculating these things. But then you can also bring in other biological information too, hopefully. Well, the 20th century, really the greatest invention of the 20th century, which is now our greatest crutch in the 21st century, is something called the cross-section. So the idea is like you have this vast landscape and what tools do you have to characterize the Earth's surface? Well, the easiest thing to do is to just go out and draw a line perpendicular to the river and measure that shape. Um, today, with the growth of better mapping technologies, we no longer really want to use cross-sections. And I'll, so, I'll show you why cross, some of the reasons why cross-sections are really uh, problematic. So when we want to evaluate the hydraulics of a river to try to get at what's going on in a river, 
we have to make a decision about how much detail we need. And um, it, maybe in the old days, the decision was just, well, this is all we can do. We can only make cross sections. We can only do simple calculations. So that's the end of the story. Today, we have much more flexibility to say, as integrated scientists, here's our problem. Now let's pull the science, no matter what it takes, like the right science, the right technology to solve this complex problem. And so that informs our decision about the level of detail that's needed between picking what are called 1D, 2D, or 3D models. So the 1D is just solving for the hydraulics at the cross-section and get a cross-sectionally average depth and velocity there. 2D means that looking down from the top, you have a pattern of depths and velocities, so you can see the actual direction, you can see eddies, vortices that are in the river. And then 3D means like if you have a waterfall, you can do that, but also if you have an eddy, I mean, you can, you can have like a boil, water can be boiling up, or you can have a little whirlpool that's sucking down within whatever the resolution is of the, the model you're making. And I'm gonna illustrate these in more detail. Now, the, the biggest challenge with making a one-dimensional model with cross-sections is that it takes so much expert judgment to, to make decisions about things. And the most important is just deciding where should the cross-sections go. There are like hundreds of journal articles that say, we went out and put cross-sections in pools and in riffles. Well, OK, where? At the head of the pool, in the middle of the pool, what kind of pool? And if you now try to do a, a synthesis of like 50 studies and try to understand what the science conclusion is, people, you can, but it doesn't mean anything because it, you don't have no idea what they actually sampled. In theory, the best place to put at least one set of cross sections would be at all the what we call hydraulic controls. These are places where there's significant changes in the channel geometry. You know, like if you have a riffle, that's a dam. And so that's blocking things, slowing it down. So you'd like to have a cross section that has that. If you have a big constriction, you'd like to catch the exact spot where that constriction is, because that's like a nozzle that's holding up the whole system. So getting these uh, is very important. On the other hand, as a desktop exercise, it's almost impossible to know where these are from your office, even just using Google Earth or something. You might have to decide the number of cross sections as part of your budgeting not based on an actual field reconnaissance. Uh, it's often in many consulting reports or government reports, they just use uniform spacing, like having a cross section every kilometer. Uh, of course, only having accessible locations. Uh, so here's just an example um, where here's a longitudinal profile of a river. So elevation on y-axis and distance upstream. So it's a, you know, a really steep mountain river, especially in this upper area. And here's a place where there's a really deep hole. So there's like, these are pools, and then there are riffle crests in between them. Well, following standard, you know, like government, you know, dam relicensing procedures, we created a one-dimensional model, and its longitudinal profile is this. And basically, it cuts off every single riffle crest and every single pool, because there's just way more detail in the, in the profile than you would go out and, you know, be able to afford to get all those cross sections. Now, if you had the full map, you could then put the cross sections wherever you want as a, you know, a desktop exercise. But if, you, if you're gonna make the field data collection and you don't know a whole lot before that, then the odds of really capturing that is really low. What can you do once you have a cross section? We can just use some standard textbook equations to estimate um, what the depths and velocities are. Um, you know, most places in the world in the U.S. use this empirical function called, uh, called Manning's equation, and so it's shown here. And um, the important thing about both of these equations is the fact that they're very sensitive to slope. And, you know, slopes of a river could be like 0.00001. You know, and so, and even in a, in a steep river, uh, even if the slope is 1%, doing a really good job of estimating the reach scale slope can be very hard. So these equations are very sensitive to those slope values. The end, the end part here is like the roughness, so estimating how rough or smooth a channel is. 
Conveniently, there is a free program called WinXS Pro and many others that will just, if you put in your cross-sectional data, just computes everything for you and uh, will make you know, the results that you, that you can want. So you know, this has been used for decades because it's just so convenient and so easy to deploy. A one-dimensional numerical model is only, it, now we're gonna solve the actual equations of motion averaged in time and uh, at averaged cross sections. And so you're gonna have an answer at each cross section. The cross sections, you know, you can, you can articulate the details of the cross section if you want, but space from one to another to another, you don't have any information. And typically it'll be something like this, but if you already have lots and lots of data, you could put in many, many, many cross sections with a lot of detail. It just depends on what you have. And these models solve for the water surface elevation and the cross sectionally averaged velocity. Just think about it for a minute. If you're a fish holding in the bottom in here in this crack, then you're gonna be given the same velocity that's the average of the whole thing. So like your ability to resolve any of that variability, just it's not there. However, we're all good at making fudge. And so we have a simple fudge factor that we can do, which is that if you take your cross section and you look at the relative depth across the cross section, you could just simply say, well, let's distribute the velocity to preserve the same amount of discharge as we have in that cross section so that you have the highest velocity and the greatest depth and the lowest and the lowest depth. And so these are built into a lot of 1D models to just give you that, that distributional pattern. Um, that's generally okay, but when a river is meandering, then a lot of times as flow increases, the flow will just cut right across the meander. It won't follow that deepest path. So for low flows, that's reasonable, not so much for floods. Now, why do we need to know better than that? Well, because we all have homes, living in the floodplain, various places around the world, and we want to get that flood hazard figured out better. We're also really, really interested in riparian ecology now. So where are the locations where cottonwood seeds will be able to grow on the recession limb of the snowmelt regime, things like that. And that all depends on being able to predict floods and the spatial pattern of that water inundation and depth of inundation very accurately. We also need to know a lot about erosion and deposition projects, whether it's for a traditional road bridge crossing or whether it's you're, you're building a river restoration project and it's going to erode. Or you're going to do a flow regulation like the biggest environmental flows experiment might have been the Grand Canyon experiments that were done in the mid 90s. And, um, you know, the big question is, would you grow sandbars with those floods or not? So being able to predict that you need more detail. And then finally, if, you, if you're talking about an organism of any small size, um, it, organisms don't know cross sections. And so, you know, being able to look in detail at the locations where that organism is actually using the river is really important. The first step, which has just been such a fantastic transformation over the last decade, has been the acquisition of all these new technologies for mapping the topography of the land. Um, you know, LIDAR is probably like the word in geoscience of the last decade. And it just means using a laser from airplanes to be able to map the ground surface in, in, in very, very high resolution. Today, we typically fly to get about 30 points per square meter with LIDAR. Uh, similarly, there's echo sounders. So off a boat, if the water is deep enough, you can, you can put different kind of structures and get those. Um, this is with a blimp, but of course today you all know we have drones and uh, of helicopter, quadrocopters, and all those things that you can use to get imagery. You can stitch all those images together and make three-dimensional trains from those. So there's a lot of new technologies. Moving beyond topography alone, between imagery and hyperspectral imagery, we can get more ecological functions to look at you know, primary production, or maybe you can actually see organisms as they're doing functions or you know, uh, utilizing different areas of the river. So that then gives you the opportunity with that kind of data to move on to two-dimensional or three-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling. 
So this is looking down on a river and the same place, the top image is showing a depth pattern and this bottom is the same location at the same flow showing velocity. So dark is you know, the deeper areas to shallow. And then I don't know why, but I have this bias where to me red is slow and blue is fast. That's just the way it is. And then the vectors here show the, the directions of the flow that are going along with that. One of the things, like, like I was saying before, if you wanted to know something about the riparian zone, being able to look at any given discharge, so from 300 CFS all the way out to 110,000 CFS, seeing how you increase the size of your, your fill of the valley floor is really interesting. And you, know, you, know, you, you, you go from maybe this uh, cross section that's really narrow to then super wide, and just the, the overall complexity and the almost unpredictability of like where things are gonna be wide or, or narrow um, is all revealed when you use 2D and 3D modeling that's really, really important. So what are some examples of two-dimensional models? Um, there are a variety of them out there. Um, River 2D is one that has been used quite a lot. It's, it's one that biologists tend to use quite a bit. It's free, you can just download it and go. Um, and then there's all these different you know, names and things, but I'm using a lot, a commercial model from Australia called TwoFlow, and I wrote a textbook based on this model with SRH2D, which is a free government model, but it helps if you have some commercial software to help with the pre and post processing. Um, the technology is just changing very fast. And I think one of the complications is that most of these codes are written by academics or people like who are doing a PhD. And so, you know, in engineering, they code up a model. The problem is that us as people who work on water are not experts at the latest and greatest of like artificial intelligence or computing with you know, the, the, the fastest video game cards that are on the market or these different things. So that's one of the advantage of the commercial software packages is like they have the financial incentive to want to make their models really big and fast. And so you know, like when I started in this in you know, 1998, we could do 100 meters of channel you know, with, with, with still one meter resolution, but you know, really, really small sections. No, you know, this, a little bigger than the size of this room. And today, uh, we're doing models that are you know, 50 to 100 kilometers long with millions of elements, but other people are running models. I mean, there are models of the entire Central Valley, you know, which could be up to 100 million computational cells in 2D. So that's what is enabled by you know, parallel processing co computation. Um, Three-dimensional modeling, you know, you'd think that in, in many ways this is the ultimate goal, like see all of the complexity of what's there and as you go around and meander bend. Of course, the flow of rivers is extremely complex and there's a lot of fine scale turbulence mechanisms. There's sometimes this big corkscrew flow that's going on. So 3D models aim to capture all of that. Um, but the fundamental problem that we have with this is that uh, first of all, it's very hard to validate. So how do you go out and get data to confirm that that is there? But the more important thing is, once you know that 3D flow pattern, then you turn to your biologist and you say, okay, where's the fish? And unless they have swum around and have learned that 3D experience, and unless someone with sediment knows like just this spot, and it, it you know, it's not only where is erosion gonna take place, but is it the, Downstream vector, is it the straight up vector? Is it the cross vector? Like exactly what is doing it? And the most horrifying thing is like we, we had some uh, people interviewing for faculty positions in geology and a person gave a presentation who's like amazing at modeling in 3D and fine detail. And when you get down to the finest level of what the individual grains are doing, a whole nother world opens up with just infinitely more complex flow patterns and the porosity that's there. So. It's, so in order to have a link to environmental flows, we have to have a marriage between the physical processes and our understanding of the ecological functions or the geomorphic functions. And that link, we don't have that in 3D very well. There's a few instances where we do, but comparatively with, you know, with the, with the two-dimensional models you know, and, and this sort of thing, 
you can pretty much, a biologist will tell you what's going to happen where, and so that marriage is working. The, the next thing beyond all that is what we call morphodynamic modeling. So, so far, the 1D, 2D, 3D models I've mentioned, that's just for a static. Like, that's take, like, pretend the river is made out of concrete and never changes, and let's see what happens. I mean, nobody really analyzes for management purposes uh, how the river dynamism is playing out over 50 to 100 years. We have one person here, Eric Larson, who's the expertise in that, right? But still, that's, you don't see that in the management context so often. And so a morphodynamic model, can, you can take a, a landscape and you can evolve it. And, and uh, you know, here, uh, and this was for an anthropological study to understand where people would, you know, build homes on a floodplain. But, but still, so this is like the next level. And so there are these models. These models are effectively just toys at this point, you know, like things that scientists do that don't necessarily have a basis in reality yet. But it's kind of like the first time I saw a LIDAR, I was like, well, that's really, really, really inaccurate. I don't want that. But maybe someday, you know, and so that's the same thing with morphodynamic modeling. We really would like it to be there, but, you know, maybe in 20 years it will be. Um, okay, so I've covered the overall supply of sediment and water and how that's important driving what's going to happen in a river. I've tried to give you a sense of um, when you get down to the scale of a river, how to think about it in 1D, 2D, and 3D contexts. Now we get to the point of saying, well, what do you do? Like, how, you know, what do you actually want to know about the river uh, that links to an environmental flow and the ecological functions? And um, there was a, there's an interesting article written by someone, I think, from NOAA, Michelinie et al., 2000. And it was talking about trying to understand what makes a viable Salmonid population in the Western U.S., and, I, and I'm sure Peter Moyle will be talking more about this next week when he talks about, from a state perspective, what is good condition. There are different elements that you need to have, that you have to have a population in a sufficient abundance. There has to be diversity in the genetics. There has to be suitable opportunities for individual growth and individual healthy condition. And then you have to have a spatial structure. And that can be interpreted in two ways. First, just the geographic distribution of the individuals of that population. So from Alaska to Southern California, you know, Chinook salmon exist in different um, subpopulations that are conditioned to the local region that they have been adapted to. But there's also a recognition that there's a physical spatial structure at work too and it's governed by the processes that generate or affect that biological distribution. So if we take the word spatial structure and remove the biological concept of just different organisms living around in different areas and focus on, well, what is that environmental <clears throat> fitness regime that's shaping that, that we want to understand that pattern of spatial structure and how that changes through time. So how do we do that? And then not just what constitutes good condition of an individual fish, but what constitutes a good condition for the environmental regime. And ultimately, the environmental flows are the, the flow part of trying to create that spatial structure. But that goes hand in hand with the topography and vegetation and sediment. Well, we can look first from a habitat perspective. So habitat being the physical variables and you can also throw in the chemical variables. So you've got you know, temperature, depths, velocities, things like that. So we can look at what are the, the, the geographic distributions of organisms and then relative to these different physical attributes that are there. And then ultimately, our expectation is that if you have something that's living in or near water, that it's going to be influenced by that physical template that's out there. Not always, not necessarily, but, um, but we have seen that those links are quite strong. So we, but you always want to ask the question and prove that in each instance. And then when we get to the processes, if I try to just extract what's the most essential thing you have to have out of environmental flows. Does the river have persistent yet organized fluvial landforms? And then here's a phrase that 
is very complicated, but do you have multiple layers? Like, you know, like if you take a cake and you cut into it and you see all the little pieces, when you look at the landscape, it too needs layer upon layer upon layer of features that when you integrate all of them, create a complex heterogeneity to the landscape, but are organized. You know, there's a self-organization to the landscape. So you have to have, oops, you have to have um, organized fluvial landforms at multiple scales to create sufficient stability and diversity of habitats to support viable populations. And then it's not enough to just have stability, but you have to have a dynamic wet season flow regime to promote rejuvenation of all of these things. So things don't have to be stable in that this spot always stays the same, but that that spot may be destroyed, but when it's destroyed, an equivalent spot opens up somewhere else, creating rejuvenation. So those are the two ingredients. You have to have that diversity, but it, not just random diversity, but organized structured patterns. And you have to have dynamism in the system to renew that. So how do you evaluate the physical habitats that might be there as well as the processes that would reflect that dynamism? Well, once you have your model outputs that come from running a 1D, 2D, 3D model, there's three types of things you can do with them. First, you can have some kind of equation to stick on the end of it. Like, oh, I know the fish like this depth. Okay, so I'll just take the depths and I'll say how much do they like it and I have my like function and that's there. So you could have an equation. Another thing is like bed shear stress is a common thing. Another thing you could do is you could have a decision tree. So you, and uh, anyone who does like tree classifications, literal tree, you know, to f with a field guide or something, it's the same idea. Um, if these conditions are this way in the river, then this. If not, then that. And so you can make a set of decision trees that would interpret what the ecological functionality are. And that could just be as simple as ranges of values or distances to things too, in, to make a decision tree. And then the last thing would be the most complicated, which is you could put you could take the outputs of your hydraulic model and put that into the next model, which could be a life cycle of a you know, population growth model. So you know, fish coming in from the ocean, they've got to go up to the river, they hit your part of the river, they take the results of your model, use it to grow their populations or kill their populations, and then onward. Um, there are models that will take individual organisms and have them move through your hydrodynamic results. And that might be tracking the energy, energy consumption and uh, growth of that organism. And then you can always make your own custom algorithms. And that's what most of my students work on is like coming up with new ways of analyzing ecological functions together with having the hydraulic model results. And I mean, it's just the big philosophical question is if you're going to set an environmental flow, how many ecological functions do you have to test to design it? Do you do everybody? Do you do every frog? Do you do every fish, every bug, every, every, everything? So you have the model of everythingism, or are there just some key indicators that you can use and get away with that or not? Or, or you could just say, well, we only care about salmon. And that's what, you know. So those are some of the difficult choices that have to be thought through. One of the equations that we commonly use with hydrodynamic model results are called habitat suitability curves. So biologists can go out, they can look at the distribution of where organisms tend to occur and where they don't occur. And based on that information, either on a data-driven process or on an expert basis, they can come up with a curve. So on the x-axis is the distribution of that variable as it exists in a, in a setting or region. And then the y-axis is a measure of suitability, where one means perfectly suitable, and zero means you won't find that organism at all. Now, with these habitat suitability curves, these are not probabilities. There's a big debate going on in the Central Valley about misunderstanding of it. This doesn't mean that there's a 40% chance that you will find an organism at that location. That's not what that means, but sometimes people mistakenly think that. These curves are just scaled from zero to one to show you know, the relative quality of that uh, and the relative suitability. Um, and so you can do these for multiple um, different physical or chemical variables to the extent that you have data to put into it. 
One of the things about the way this is portrayed is these are individual variables or univariate. But as you can imagine in a real river, they tend to come together. You know, you may have an area that's both high velocity and low depth or an area that's high velocity and high depth. So there's a mutual you know, functionality to that that probably matters. In general, my experience is that it works well in a predictive capability to use them this way in a univariate mode. But if, if you were to make a model and the observations didn't match that, it would be very reasonable to look at the joint distribution of these to get it more. And just as one example, we have one where, um, depending on the size of the organism, they have an ability to move different size sediment. So let's say you're an organism and you can move a 25 millimeter grain on the riverbed. Well, that's if there's zero velocity. Now you go to a spot where the velocity is four feet per second, all of a sudden they can move a hundred millimeter grain because they have the assist from the water. So there is a, a joint you know, effect of how velocity works together with the organism to promote its capabilities. So that's an example of that. If you take, if you, if you take these results, and um, we, you, know, you put this onto the hydraulic model. So you just, anywhere you have a pixel and it has a value of 1.5, you go up, you get that value. And you can just fit, you, can, you, know, you can perfectly fit curves to, to capture this or you know, however you want to do it. Then you can produce maps that look like this, where the colors represent a range of that number, of that habitat suitability. And this is just broken up in equal intervals. Um, there's no rule about how you break this up. You just have to evaluate what's going to be meaningful. And so in this case, blue would represent the area <coughs> that is predicted to be the highest quality based on a 2D model. And then white is an area that there shouldn't be any organisms. And then the black dots show the organisms as they actually use the site that year. And I think you'll agree with me to say that there's a very strong predictive capability here. I would easily take this predictability to Las Vegas and walk away and quit this job. Be no problem at all. Um, so most of the organisms are in this blue thing. And this is just one, you know, one small site, 100 meters of, of a site. But, um, so, but now how do, we, how do we decide whether a model is good or bad? And this is you know, a universal question we can ask about anything. And there, the first thing is, the model has to um, take a chance. It has to both show you where something will occur and where it won't occur. So if I made a model and the whole river was blue, I would be 100% correct. But it would be an, an, an uninteresting prediction. You know, it's just like if I were to say, there's going to be an earthquake in the world this year. It's a good chance I'm going to be right. You know, so. You have to have places where you say it's something is not going to happen as well as places where it will happen. And then the other thing is the places where you say it's going to happen need to be your high value areas, not the low value areas. Um, but it's important to recognize that. So how do you take this result and test to see the quality of that, that prediction? Uh, we call this bioverification, just to differentiate it from validation, which is validation is used in the hydraulic model assessment. So we just changed it up. Um, so imagine a scenario like this, where the stars are your observations, and you know most of them are in the blue, but some are these other colors. Well, what we do is we first ask of the whole river domain, what fraction of the river is blue? And then we, and then you could imagine that if I were to just randomly throw stars up there, that the, the most likely outcome is that the fraction of stars that would be in the blue area would exactly equal the percent of the area that is blue. And that's true for all this. So in order for something to be a good prediction, the percent of the stars that are in an area of interest have to exceed, and preferably quite a lot exceed, the relative area of, those, of that color. So for example here, 72% of the stars are in the blue area, but that's only 35%. So we have more than double the you know, density of stars in blue as there is blue area. So that means we have you know, twice as many as you would expect from random chance alone. And you can do that. And then conversely, on the other side, you want to see the opposite. So for red, there's only about a quarter 
as many as you would have from random chance alone. Now, the next thing is, well, this tells you, um, it gives you a sense of how unlikely it is, but depending on the number of observations you have, the odds of getting these results can change quite a lot. So if I only do things like, like imagine if you flip a coin, you know, if you flip a coin, you don't get the 50-50 percentages until you flip it like 100 times. So similarly here, if I only have five or 20 or even 40 observations of something an organism is doing, it's very possible that you could get something that looks very unusual, but it is actually random. You know, random produces patterns too. So we, we developed a test called a bootstrapping test where you throw many, many random attempts at it for the, this, using the same number of observations as you have. And then that can tell it, give you statistical confidence limits and say how that plays out. So here's an example from the data on the lower Yuba River looking at Chinook salmon, where we have like 3,000 observations in this one spawning season. And these are the statistical confidence limits. So they're very, very tight because of that 3,000 number of samples. And so you see the most number of adult spawning taking place in the highest quality, and then it just drops down. So pretty much if the value is greater than 0.4, that's sufficient habitat suitability that the fish prefer that better than random chance alone. And then if it's below 0.4, they're, they're still there sometimes, but they're avoiding it more than random chance, and we have well more than a 95% confidence that this is real and not just an artifact of a random process. So this is a very robust analysis framework for assessing whether the physical habitat predictions that come from a hydraulic model put together with a biological habitat suitability curve, whether that is performing well. And you can imagine this is quite useful in designing an environmental flow. The next level, if you want to go one step further, is it's not enough to just say, well, there's more in the blue. Like, does it matter that this is a really big patch and that this is a very skinny patch and this is a small patch? So given, imagine that you had the exact same amount of, of black and white in these three pictures. Does it matter that these are big blobs or would the fish be equally happy if everybody had their little house with a white picket fence and they're not allowed to share and talk to their neighbors? Um, so we want to ask that patch question. So all you do now is you just look at the number of organisms by patch size and you can do the same kind of test. So this, these are the ratios and we find very strong differences where <coughs> fish actually prefer relatively small patches and they avoid the really giant patches. I mean, I would guess that a, a good reason for this would be that when you have very large patches, there's a lot less cover, uh, a lot less holding or resting habitat for you know, different kinds of refugia. And so being able to get to places that, you know, they, you know, let's say an adult needs to, to rest for a while, then she's gonna go out and dig in the, in the sand, sediment and come back. I mean, we'll see that kind of behavior a lot. And so I think that could be a reason for that patch size preference. Okay, so that just gives you a, a flavor for how you can go about an ecological assessment with, uh, with hydraulic modeling. Now we want to look at, well, what about the geomorphic dynamism? This is really hard to do, but there's, there's, there are simple tools that are out there too. So the first thing we need to do is we need to reconstruct, well, what are the landforms in a river? Like if we want to say the fish are on a riffle or they prefer to hold in a pool, what does that actually mean? How do we decide where riffles and pools are? And typically, if you look down, you know, if you look along a river from top down, you know, maybe this big pink blob here is a riffle that's spanning the whole river. And maybe there's a deep pool, but it's only like one third of the river. So there's a there's a patchiness to the landforms, just like you can see in this photo. Here's an island here, and a, and a you know a rapid there, and so forth. <coughs> But unfortunately, like a lot of the words we use, like riffle, pool, run, glide, they, they can mean the underlying landform, the structure of the land, or they could relate to just an assemblage of hydraulics and sediment conditions that are taking place in the river. And so I like to differentiate a morphological unit being the landform itself from the mesohabitat, which is the assemblage of all physical attributes over that landform. And so the mesohabitat will change from flow to flow, 
but the, um, the, the, the morphological unit doesn't change. Other people say geomorphic unit or channel unit. I mean, it's all the same. But, um, however, you know, rivers, well, it's, to me, the first time I you know, was, was in Davis, and you go to a river, and it's dry, and you can see the whole structure of the river. Like, that's, that's really cool. But most rivers don't totally run dry, and uh, uh, we don't want them to run dry. Um, so, you know, you often want to take advantage of the flow information at a low flow to help assess what those units are. And so traditionally, what do people do? Well, you go out in the field, you send your grad student now, you map this river. And so then they go out and they sketch something or they have their GPS and they come back and that is the map. And it means for the rest of eternity, no one will ever know what they did, how they did it. And if anyone ever went back, it would come out different. You know, it, <clears throat> the, the, the problem of um, the subjectivity of what we do, it's just, it's a really challenging thing. So what we wanted to do was have a framework of mapping morphological units that would be transparent and you could change it and it would be repeatable. So what we do is we have stakeholders who are experts in a local river develop a decision tree. And this is a decision tree that can be shown in just a simple 2D graph of velocity versus depth for the low flow of a river um, to get the in-channel riverbed units that are, you know, that are out there. This is the one we developed for the Lower Yuba River. It, biologists were in there, you know, I was in there, engineers were in there. And we base, you, know, you use the field knowledge you have from going out in the field, but instead of it just being like, oh, I see riffles there, okay, that's gonna be the, rip, the riffle. It's like bring that knowledge back and now let's write down what are the thresholds that are defining those features you're seeing in the field. If 10 years from now, somebody has a better way, you can unpack all this data and redo it and you know, make something new of the old data. You don't have to rely on the old map, um, but you have something that hopefully is consensus-based as it was here or is expert-based if you're doing it on your own. And then you take this classification, you assign this decision tree to analyze the results of your model, and you get a, a pattern that looks like this. So here, red is riffle, um, this, this like uh, teal color is like shoots, and you've got your slack water areas. And so we get this beautiful pattern of the diversity of rivers where you may have like five to seven units across the channel. You know, the, the pool doesn't have to be river wide, and maybe in some places it is. Um, and so you have these features. And now you could look to see whether these morphological units relate to the different ecological functions. Another thing that's become really powerful is something called topographic change detection, which is the idea is if you go out and you map a river at two different times, so you have a map from 2000, you map again in 2010, or maybe you have a map of the Feather River before Oroville you know, Dam had a big disaster and now you map it again. And just in the simplest idea, if you just subtract the maps from each other, then here in red, we show the areas of erosion, and in blue, the areas of deposition. And so you can get this subtracted pattern. And all this other text that you don't really need to read just says, how do you decide if, the, if these changes are real or if they're an artifact of the different surveying methods you used in those two approaches? And so we have really good techniques for figuring that out. And so that leads to what we could do now, which is what, which is, this is what everybody's trying to do. Everybody has done at least once to go to their river. You've mapped it once. You go back a couple of years later and map it again and see how it's changed. But, you know, soon we're going to have like, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of remapping and incredible things are going to come out of it. So this just shows the Yuba River from Englebright Dam, and then it's in three pieces all the way down to Marysville. And as you can see, I do a lot of work on the Yuba, so I have those examples. Um, and so the areas that are sandy to red are the erosion areas, and you know, up to 20 meters of erosion where you have like major bank retreat taking place, you know, just massive amounts of, of, of uh, erosion and deposition. And I was at a, a conference in, in New Orleans, the, the AGU conference, and there's a lot of work going on on the East Coast um, that, that's showing the um, changes that are taking place out of the entire state of Pennsylvania in all streams. And like this river has more cut and fill than the entire state of Pennsylvania in this one river alone. So they were pretty, pretty shocked. 
Um, and try to understanding what's driving that. You can take your velocity pattern, turn velocity into shear stress, and look at the, these are the locations that would be predicted to have that frictional force taking place. And you can see the flow is like leaving the channel and wanting to cut off those meander bends. Okay, so now I'm just gonna try to put this together in a very quick example. So imagine you want to restore river. Well, the way design ought to work is you come up with a variety of different alternative competing designs based on all the input from biologists and you know geologists and uh, everybody who's got an opinion, the fisher, fishermen. And so here's an example where we have six different designs for what the topography could be where red is high and blue is low. And we want, you know, as a scientific question, these two have very high relief and these are very relatively subtle by comparison. So what is the effect of these on habitat and erosion? So we can make maps, like I've showed you before, uh, Chinook spawning um, for the two different designs and then what the, what the fry are doing you know, soon after they emerge from the gravel. And these are all at the same discharge. So you can see like this might give really good spawning habitat, but it's actually worse for fry habitat. So, and then you could take all of your different designs and you could look to see whether you're getting new habitat that never existed or whether you're taking existing habitat and making it good. And those are two different metrics. And you find out, well, gee, design six does really well at this and it does well at this but it doesn't do so good at that. But, you know, so you can, you can assess which one does the best. So that's just that piece of it. And then the last thing is, well, if you can design channels, and this is where we were 15 years ago, where we are today now is here. We can design entire synthetic river quarters with multiple layers of natural features. I mean, if we only had excavators to recreate this in real life, but still, um, this is where we're going. So, you know, here's a completely synthetic mountain range with uh, three different geomorphic channel types that are in here. So we can make these archetypes to show what these channels ought to look like, and then you would want to put in the different environmental flows that go with that. And, of course, I have to promote my old textbook, but, you know, if you want to know more about the details, I've got tons of videos on my website you can watch for free as well as the book. And so just in conclusion... Now, environmental flows uh, are really an important leg to fixing the environment, but you know, uh, changing the topography of the landscape is one piece of it. Managing the sediment that's coming out of the mountains is another huge piece of it. And then, of course, the chemistry is just totally crazy, but all of that has to go together. Um, we understand a lot about the physical processes, but the thing we understand the least is the details of these spatial patterns and then evolving them through time. And like trying to get that time component is really, really critical. Um, modeling is now surpassed the data. So we have lots of models. We've got new technologies with data, but still on the biological side, it's really, really expensive and labor intensive to get biological data. And a lot of what students are doing now is like, it's all coding, you know, like code me an analysis to analyze this species and this, this problem that it has and things like that. So this should give you some good guidance as you move on to hear more about fish and other organisms for environmental flows. Hopefully this gave you a good overview of the physical processes. It's a lot to digest, it's always it's a lot of information, yeah. Is that a software Yeah, this, so this comes from a commercial software platform called World Machine. Um, I worked with the developer of this software. We integrated this code that my student Rocco Brown had developed into his platform. And this platform is used in the video game industry and in Hollywood industry quite a bit. So that's that, unfortunately, it's, it's closed source, you know, uh, there's no manual. It's really, really hard to break into these tools, but it was, it was a worthwhile effort. So now we've written the, the software into R and we've, we keep trying to upload it to CRAN, but there's little things they want us to fix. But anyway, it's going to be freely available on, on CRAN. And that will do all the channel part. 
we haven't coded in the world machine um, terrain editor like, like for that, but anyway, but but it but clearly it can be done. Yep. <clears throat> Well, yeah, so, um, so temperature, you know, with temperature, you can fly over in an airplane with an infrared camera and get a snapshot of the surface temperature. But temperature, it's, it's still a really big problem because we, we would like to know the three-dimensional structure of temperature in a river. And so I have a grad student who is doing like this really, really challenging project with someone in computer science to make a grid of temperature sensors in a, in a river um, with that talk to each other through wireless network technology. And so they've had to like, you know, code an entire wireless backbone. I mean, all stuff that I don't even understand, right? Um, but it's, so temperature is a really, really big problem and, and really important. Um, on the chemistry side, we generally assume that regulated flows that would come from dam are clean water, you know, right? And so that can help with the dilution part of it. But that's not always true. There are certainly reservoirs in mining regions that are highly contaminated waters. One thing we might, um, with regard to the temperature thing, so uh, what's been really nice is we're trying to cover, right, you know, flow, ecology, sediment, geomorphology, but the chemistry aspects of water are equally as important. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not something we're really gonna spend like a whole week talking about. Um, but the water temperature regimes for all biologic species are huge and really should be considered mm -hmm in concert with the flow and the sediment and the topography. Um, and even just temperature alone, you know, we do have fairly decent water temperature models that get incorporated into a lot of environmental flow assessments, but that's often a piece that, you know, is not well coupled, it's well coupled with flow, obviously, but it's not well coupled necessarily with some of the ecology or the geomorphology and topography. So it's, a, it's another branch, I guess, another aspect. Environmental flows are very integrative, which is what's so interesting and great about them. Actually, last, uh, on the last session, we were discussing about there is not only one discipline, it's multiple disciplines, and then how all those people from different disciplines talking to each other, and also trying to not only talk to, understand, to, to find out the, the um, what are the key issues, what, what is actually important for all the different disciplines, what I was start at the beginning talking about the perspectives. Um, you have worked a lot in the Yuga, in the Yuga River, and you've had a lot of experience with the Army Corps, with um, Cuba, Cuba County Water Agency, and with other guys. What's, what's your, your, what is your take on those policy decision making, regulation processes? Mm -hmm. You as a scientist, as a geomorphologist, and finding yourself in the middle of a room with all those guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the most important thing is that you have to be true to what you do as the scientist, you know. Um, everybody else is coming into the room where they may have an ulterior motive. And so, you know, I'm an academic, but I also get paid as a consultant, but I don't get paid enough that I want to jeopardize my independence. So no matter what, whether, and I've been on both sides, isn't there like a, a cowboy movie where the guy like Bruce Willis like gets on both sides, right? I've worked for industry and I've worked for NGOs and I've worked for agencies. And the most important thing is stay true to the science. And the, the science is always going to be more uncertain. You're always well served by really trying to be like, you know, it, let's not rush into whatever it is and let's do more on the science. At the same time, the science can't be endless. It can't just go on and on. There has to be an answer. And I've often found that the more thorough and the more um, science that you bring to the table, it just opens the door for infinitely more questions. There's always another level of understanding that people want to go. And that was, I think, the biggest surprise that I, I wasn't prepared for is like, you know, simple answers. It just shuts the door. You can't ask anything. You just... The Amazon has this many fish. Okay, I don't know. No one knows. That's your number. But if you have all these details, well, what about this thing? What about that? So, you know, that, that can really get into it. Um, 
So, but I, I haven't seen seen anything to believe that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I just think in any human endeavor, when people are in a contentious setting, which is how California is, it just tears at you. I, nobody can just be free of that. And when you look at people, and if you end up in a position where you're just constantly going from one of these battles to the next to the next, I mean, it just must tear at people. And so I think that it, being a scientist in that context, it gives us a little bit more comfort, and we're just not in that all the time. All right, yeah. Appreciate it.